again and a warm welcome back. I hope that you're all in good health as always. During this short chapter we are going to be discussing the Elevator Game Show quiz within Brookhaven Hospital. Now this might at first seem like a strange choice to analyse something that just seems a bit of harmless fun, but I can assure you with all certainty that the true intended outcome of this so-called quiz is anything but harmless or indeed fun. You will probably think here that I'm absolutely insane to even suggest that the Elevator Quiz has anything remotely to do with the Holocaust, but like I had said at the end of the last chapter, sometimes you just have to get things wrong to ultimately get things right. It is of course through our countless mistakes that we will learn to succeed in our future endeavours. Before we get started on analysing this quiz however, I just want to remind you here that you picked up the key for the elevator from the drain in the shower room. This was your reward for completing the box puzzle, which of course had provided us with the hair strands, an eternal symbol of the tragedy of the Holocaust. It is important to highlight this because the elevator might act as a metaphorical link here between the shower room, where we get the elevator key, and your punishment that you will receive later within the storage room if you get the answers incorrect. <coughs> right, let's get on with things, shall we? First up here, there is something that I want you to bear in mind. Again, I had personally played through this section of the game many times without making any connections, so don't feel bad if you had missed it also. The last thing that we come to do before heading to the elevator is to head to the hospital basement to collect the copper ring. Do you remember how we accessed the basement area in the first place? That's right. We collected the basement key, or knowledge, from the circular aperture atop the creepy mural in room M6. You know, the room that is likely a metaphorical gas chamber. Also, I want you to recall here what I had said earlier about the basement of Block 11 at Auschwitz being the location of the first use of a gas chamber at the camp. So, after using the basement key, or knowledge, that we got from the metaphorical gas chamber of room M6, we then come to collect the copper ring and head to the elevator. Of course, we can now enter the elevator because of the key, or knowledge, that we got from the shower drain that has the same green liquid that was dripping out of the aperture atop both the strange mural in room M6 and the aperture in room 202 back at the Woodside Apartments, where of course we had earlier collected the key for the clock. Surely you haven't forgotten the symbology of the scratches upon the wall of room 208. Once we are inside of the elevator, the game show Quizmaster comes over the static to rapturous applause from the audience. Well, I say applause here, but maybe, just maybe, it could be something that is much more disturbing. We will come back to that musing in a moment, but for now, let's get on with the quiz itself. The questions asked here by the Quizmaster may appear at first to be nothing more than a bit of harmless fun. In fact, they're so easy to answer that we will probably get them right by default, which of course is likely the intention of the game's artists here. But, if we are paying special attention to the demeanour of the Quizmaster, we will notice that he is almost goading us into deliberately getting the answers wrong. I will briefly explain this theory and then we can listen in. You might have also noticed a reference to the infamous American serial killer Ed Gein, this probably isn't an accident either, as we'll discuss during a later phase. Yes, it may also connect back to the Holocaust. So, firstly, the quiz host says that we can answer the questions correctly and receive a great prize. Or instead, we can answer them incorrectly and receive the punishment, with extra emphasis being placed on receiving the punishment. The quiz master then ends his address by saying that it all depends on you. This, again I feel, is the game's artists, aka Mr Ito, almost goading you into getting the answers purposefully wrong, perhaps as a kind of thought experiment here, in seeing just how inquisitive you really are. After the questions have ended, the quiz master then asks us if we have it all figured out. Again, I think the game's artists are possibly goading us here to see if we have noticed all of the clues to the Holocaust sub-story that I've highlighted so far. 
They may be asking us here if we've noticed the links perhaps between the hair strands and the showers, the basement key and the mural, or how the mural connects back to room 202 at the Woodside Apartments, and how that in turn connects to the clock puzzle and the scratches in the wall of room 208, and so on. Also, and you might have already noticed this little golden nugget, but there is a clock ticking away during the quiz. If you haven't, you will hear it when I play it back for you in a moment. Recall what I'd said previously about the clock in room 208, the scratches upon the wall, the hole in the wall of room 202, and the overall symbolic links that this possibly has back to the Holocaust. The quiz master then tells you exactly where you need to go to collect your prizes, before warning you, of course, about the punishment for getting it wrong. To emphasise this goading towards getting the answers purposefully wrong, the host then attempts to give us his best Vincent Price impression. Mwahahaha. Let us listen in to the Elevator Game Show quiz now, but make sure to pay attention to the emphasis on the quiz master when he is goading you into getting the answers purposefully wrong. What was that? Upstairs, within the third floor storeroom, the same room from Silent Hill 3 that has the torn US Constitution tossed upon the floor, and the save symbol that for me at least is clearly based upon the Pax Cultura peace symbol, we can find this jewel-encrusted box that contains our prize. 
It is worth noting here that this is the same room with the large mirror and creeping blood that can kill Heather if she can't escape in time. You'll come to understand the implied symbology of all of that bloodshed here in just a moment. Before we push the buttons though, I want to reiterate that we collect our rewards from a dual encrusted box. Before I expand upon my musing here, I want to remind you that you currently stood within a third floor storeroom of a building which might have more than its fair share of connections back to the infamous Auschwitz concentration camp. The fact that you are stood within a storeroom opening a dual encrusted box may, in all probability, be nothing more than an artistic interpretation of the theft of property at the camps. Recall previously that I'd highlighted Laura's conversations with Eddie, the possible artistic interpretation of a former Nazi camp guard, wherein she had quizzed him about his previous crimes. Was it robbery? Murder? Again, these are the primary crimes committed at the camps. Robbery and murder. We will come to revisit this kind of artistic interpretation of the theft of victims' possessions again within the Otherworld version of the Hilltop Centre in Silent Hill 3. More of that to come in due time, of course, but for now, let us ask ourselves another question. Who did this box once belong to? Well, after giving it some thought, I have arrived at the conclusion that it could have once belonged to Joseph. It is plausible, if I am somewhat correct with my analysis so far, that Joseph could have been stripped of his possessions upon arrival at Brookhaven Hospital, perhaps as an artistic interpretation here of what had happened at the camps, particularly at Auschwitz-Birkenau. This would of course explain why the jewel encrusted box has been put into the storeroom, again as an artistic reimagining of the victims' possessions being stored in Canada, the warehouses at Birkenau where the Holocaust victims' possessions were stored and horrifically fingered through by the thieving guards and camp commanders. It would also explain the new tatty box that Joseph has, the one that contains his deceased daughter's hair strands, and his strong attachments to the box, given that he now no longer has any other possessions. Again, this is 100% symbolically synonymous with the stories of many Holocaust survivors. So, if we were to get the quiz answers correct here, we will receive five boxes of shotgun shells and two ampules. Fantastic. Conversely though, what will happen if we get the quiz answers purposefully wrong, like we were seemingly being goaded into doing? Well, James is gassed. Yes, you heard that correctly. James is gassed. Here again, we are once more likely stood within a metaphorical gas chamber. Don't forget here, this is again the room within Silent Hill 3 that Heather gets locked into as the blood starts creeping out, and slowly dies if you can't escape in time. As the quiz master had once infamously asked, do you have it all figured out? Who do you think you're kidding, Mr. Ito? Of course we have it all figured out. Well, some of it at least. Let me show you again how all of this likely links together to complete yet another Holocaust-themed puzzle. So, in reverse order of the events, James is gassed here within the storeroom after completing the elevator quiz. You get the elevator key, or knowledge, from the shower drain. Showers are, of course, eternally symbolically linked to the Holocaust, because it's here that many of the victims were murdered using poison gas. To obtain the elevator key from the shower drain, we had to combine the hair strands from Joseph's box with a needle found inside of a teddy bear. Again, these items, hair strands, needles and teddy bears, are all symbolically connected back to the Holocaust, particularly at Auschwitz. Additionally, to retrieve the hair strand, you had to use the lapis eye key and the purple bull key card, both of which may be connected to the history of the Jewish people. Finally, we also collected the bloody code from the special treatment cell, which I'd noted was also the code word used for murder at Auschwitz, and of course the code left behind upon the carbon paper upon the typewriter, and how this may be symbolic of the evidence left behind at the camps. Of course, we all know the symbolic connections that typewriters have to the Holocaust. 
To begin the elevator quiz, you first need to visit the hospital basement, which I'd earlier theorised may be a reference to the first gas chamber in the basement of Block 11 at Auschwitz. To access the basement, you need to collect the basement key, or knowledge, from atop the mural in room M6. This mural, I had theorised, might be representative of the victims within the gas chambers, and of course I'd also highlighted that this room is linked to both the Creeper Room at the Historical Society and Room 205 at the Apartments, via the collection of the flashlight and the flashlight battery. Are you illuminated yet? This mural is also likely connected back to Room 202 at the Woodside Apartments, as it's probably, for all intents and purposes here, the other side of the hole in the wall. Back within Room 202 at the Woodside Apartments, we'd collected the clock key, or knowledge, from this hole, and after combining it with the scratches in the walls, we obtain the correct time that allows us to move forwards. Remember what I'd said earlier about the clock ticking during the quiz, and the creeper scratching at the walls in the historical society. Considering how so many people have missed all of this, is this all just highlighting how so many of us know so little about such a terrible tragedy? And finally, you will recall that I had mentioned about the applause from the audience during the introduction to the quiz. Let's listen to it again. Is it cheery? Or are they screaming in agony? Remember again what I had said earlier about the secret wailing on the second floor corridor that can only be heard when you're in a near-death state. Flip me, this game sure as hell wasn't what you thought it was, am I right? By the way, if you think I'm inaccurate here with this analysis of the audible cheering or wailing, I invite you to watch the credits and, obviously, the entirety of the recently released Holocaust film Zone of Interest, wherein they do exactly the same thing that I am describing here. Okay, on to the next chapter now, where we will discuss the two rings that you need to escape this hellhole, one of which we have just collected from the basement, and I will discuss a theory of how I think they might connect to the infamous spider network, or De Spinner, the Nazis get out of jail card, so to speak. Before we go though, as always, I will pick a song to play us out. Throughout this project, I have been highlighting how the Holocaust continues to appear in various forms of art, from paintings, drawings and sculptures, to movies, TV shows, and more recently, video games. This of course raises the question as to what is morally acceptable when it comes to making Holocaust-related art. To highlight this moral conundrum, here are eternally controversial British punk rockers The Sex Pistols and their shockingly named 1979 release, Belson was a gas. Thanks again for watching, take care and good luck. Goodbye.